right, today we are on week three of our new series titled uh, Growing Pains. And the vision behind this series is to teach you that spiritual maturity is hard because this means that you're going to outgrow some of the old environments you used to fit in, some of the old ways of thinking that you used to have, the ways that you used to live. And hopefully by now, because of Jesus Christ, some of the immaturities that you used to have, you no longer have in your life. But it's difficult at times. And the reason why it's difficult is because we're human and we're going to face many battles in our life. And, and so much tension is going to come sometimes into your family life, into your jobs, and you're asking the Lord, what am I supposed to do right now? So the title of today's message is this, Growing as a Warrior. Growing as a warrior, because whether you like it or not, you are going to face conflict and battles on a daily basis, but now you have to handle it as Jesus would. Now, that's more difficult because, you know, back then, if somebody said something to me, I would say, something bad. But now Jesus is like, don't say that. Turn the other cheek. And you're like, what cheek, Lord? I don't want to right now. I don't want to deal with this person. And so the Holy Spirit is going to guide you and do some new things in your life. So it's hard to grow, but we need it in our life. And I realize a lot of us are facing battles right now. And, and so some of you may relate to this because possibly you have conflict in your home life right now. And you're praying to the Lord, God, please help my marriage because the tension right now is high. We haven't had a conversation in a very long time. We never speak about anything in depth. And it just feels like we're going two different routes. We're becoming roommates in the same house. And I don't know how to keep believing. For some of you right now, you're facing a battle in your workplace. Maybe somebody you relied on and you trusted betrayed you, maybe stole from you. And now the company is um, becoming a disaster because things are going wrong. Because the people that you put in charge were not doing their job properly. And here, I've realized this when it comes to conflict and battles. The hardest battle you will face is the battle within. The hardest battle you're going to face every single day is the battle within. Those personal sins, those personal addictions that now Jesus shows up and says, Hey, listen, you can't conceal this anymore. You can't hide this from me. It's time to outgrow these things in your life because if you allow them into your life, they're always going to hinder you from the promises that I have for you. Some of you are still struggling with a broken heart that happened five years ago, maybe 10 years ago. Maybe it's a damaged self-worth and you don't know what to do. And so we're running into this conflict on a daily basis, but how do we handle this in the Jesus way? Let me ask you this question. Do you feel like a godly warrior? Do you feel like you're able to overcome these battles or do you feel like a victim because of how damaged you have been because of life or the demons that come after you? Because let me make this very clear. How you think is how you live. And so you're either going to think of yourself as in victory because of Jesus Christ, or you're going to think of yourself as a victim, and you'll always complain about everything and never see the blessing in the end. And I'm here to tell you today some good news. You already have victory in Jesus Christ. He already has put victory into your life, meaning you're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. And right. every battle you face and every temptation that comes your way. Listen to this. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Yet even in the midst of all these things, we triumph over them all. For God has made us, I love this wording right here, more than conquerors. God has made us more than conquerors and has demonstrated his love in our lives. It is his glorious victory over everything, meaning no situation in life can overtake you. No temptation of the devil can trap you. There will always be a way out. Amen. You don't have to give in to the devil. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 states it like this. The temptations in your life are no different from what others are experiencing. Meaning the temptations that you're facing right now, somebody else is going through it too. They know the struggles and so many people have come out of that and now they have testimonies of how good, uh, how good God is. And then it says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, and God is faithful. He's faithful because he would not allow the temptations to be more than you can stand. For when you are tempted, he will always show you a way out so that you can endure. Meaning every time the devil puts temptation in front of your face, Jesus shows up and says, this is the way out. But it's your choice. And so you're either going to choose to follow the devil or you're going to choose to follow God in the way out and see freedom in your life. Meaning you can conquer the conqueror because of Jesus Christ. Isn't that so good? So do me a favor, look to somebody next to you and say, my God can take down giants. 
my God can take down some giants. And you know, if we're mentioning giants, you know we're going to talk about King David today. Uh, oh my goodness. I love King David's stories. One of my favorite stories. Uh, David is a complex character because here is a warrior of God, yet at the same time, he is a worshiper of the Lord. He is somebody that will kill you, and he will write poetry that will make you cry. Okay, he has an interesting character. And I was diving into so many stories of King David. I was like, oh, I got to say this. I got to say that. And the Lord's like, no, you can't. It's going to be for the next series. So just get ready for the next series. We're going to dive deeper into the life of David. But today we're going to talk about his victory over the battles that he's faced. And so how we can learn from him and grow as a godly warrior. So let's go ahead and dive in. Point number one is this. Your anointing is still a process. Your anointing from the Lord, what God has spoken over your life is still a process. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, let me give you some background information first. The army of Israel is being mocked and pushed back by this crazy giant named Goliath. And according to the scriptures, Goliath is around, um, what was it? He was around, yeah, nine feet, six inches tall. Nine feet, six inches tall. Some even think he was nine feet, nine inches tall. Just to put that in perspective, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, the tallest man ever recorded in that book was eight feet, 11 inches. So here's Goliath, almost 10 feet tall. He's pure muscle. He's raging like a Hulk, and he's blaspheming the God of Israel. He has no problem blaspheming God. And some of the demonic giants that you face on a daily basis, they have no problem with that either. They'll always condemn you for following the Lord. They'll always make fun of you for believing in the promises of God. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 5 through 11. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail, listen to this, weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. Verse 8, Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites, Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am, listen to the wording here, I am the Philistine champion. You are only servants of Saul. You notice what he did there? See, demonic giants also like to build themselves up and put you down. I'm bigger than you. I'm stronger than you. I will conquer you. You are only this. You come from that. You're never going to amount to anything. And some of you know what it's like to hear that on a daily basis too because of the people in your life. Maybe somebody who was supposed to encourage you or be with you, maybe even in a relationship, all they did was brag about themselves and put you down. It was always your fault. This is a demonic behavior. This is a demonic characteristic that we see. The giant talks himself up, puts them down because it's a mental battle. You understand that? The spiritual battle that we face is also a mental battle. If the enemy can get in your head and make you feel defeated, you become defeated. If you don't know the victory that you have in Jesus Christ. So then he starts to challenge the men of Israel. He says, choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. For I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they went into battle. That's not what happened. When Saul and the men of Israel, the the army of God heard this, they shuddered in fear. See, this is what happens. The devil knows. Listen, I'm telling you, if he can convince you to go and hide, you have already believed his lie. If the devil can convince you to hide away from him every time, don't talk about the devil, pastor. Don't talk about demons. Don't talk about spiritual warfare. That stuff just kind of creeps me out. And I don't know about that. And I would like not to know about that. Well, then, then you don't know how to fight the enemy. And you have no idea what kind of open doors you have in your life and how the enemy has come into your relationships and into your family and into your home life because you don't want to talk about it. Guess what? It's time to grow and talk about it. It's time to have a conversation and get into the word of God because so many of us as believers in Christ who should have victory, instead we come in here and we're terrified. Well, my life is falling apart and everything's going wrong and I don't know what to do, pastor. Do you trust God? Yeah, I trust him, but I'm terrified. Why are you so terrified? 
You shouldn't fear the world or the people of the world. I fear God. God is in control of all things because the moment God shows up, demons have to run. The devil has to bow down. There's only one God that we serve. And he will always come and protect us. He sends a rescue mission on your behalf. And so they heard this from the giant and they were terrified and they were deeply shaken. And listen, this is what's embarrassing. This is the army of God. This happened for 40 days. 40 days. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 16. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the time you wake up, in the afternoon, when you're about to go to bed, this giant would rise. This Philistine champion, listen to the wording here. He strutted in front of the Israelite army. Who wants to take me down? Who's brave enough for 40 days? 40 out of the Bible means a time of testing. And so for 40 days, the Lord was testing the army of Israel. Do you have enough faith that this giant can be taken down, even though he's much bigger and stronger than you? because he seems confident in his defiance. But then all of a sudden, if you know the story, here's what I love, young David shows up. Young David comes out of nowhere. Now, why did young David show up? Was he ready to fight already? Here's the background. His father, Jesse, sent him to bring some food for his brothers. And so his father gave him some bread and gave him some cheese. So let me say it like this. David showed up as the pizza delivery boy. (laughs) That's why he showed up to the battle. I got some pizza, you guys hungry? And then what I love about David, he started to notice something. Something's off. You ever walk into somebody's house and the atmosphere changes? You ever even sometimes, it can even be in the church. When you experience spiritual warfare going on, you're like, man, there's something going on here. There's times that God has called me to preach and I get on this stage. I'm like, no, we still got to fight a battle first. There's a spiritual battle going on in this room so that we can hear the Lord and receive the revelations from him. David is noticing something is wrong. This Philistine is mocking God. And everybody's hiding, and they're scared. And so what I love about the story, David starts going around, and I kind of imagine it like this. He's like, hey, hey, um, what happens to the guy that takes down the giant? What rewards does he get? And so they start telling him all the things that this man will get who takes down the giant, that he's going to marry Saul's daughter and, and just have all this, all this blessings in his life. So he keeps asking the question. He asked it so much, it got back to his older brother, and it got on his nerves. So now, this is kind of funny to me, there's a family conflict in the middle of the battle. Isn't that how it happens? There's spiritual warfare going on, and you're like, I'm trying to focus on fighting the devil, but then all of a sudden, a family member gets upset. All of a sudden, something is brought back up from the past that happened, again, five years ago, and you're like, you're still on this? Can we get past this and move? Because we really need to fight the enemy, because right now, he's dividing up our family. Got on his older brother's nerves. First Samuel. 17, 28 through 30. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. Now listen to this word again. He said, what are you doing here anyway? He demanded. What about these few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of, David? Aren't you in charge of the sheep? Why are you here ready to fight? I know about your pride and deceit. Isn't it funny how all of a sudden, because of jealousy in his brother's life, he uh, gave him a lot of accusations, false accusations over his character. As soon as David showed up, he was just there to give him food. Like, I showed up to give you guys food. This is a blessing. And now you're giving false accusations on my character because you don't want me here. Some people don't want you in the room. Some people don't want you in the battle, but God has called you to the battle. I didn't even put that in there. Somebody write that down. I want to say that later. Man, but God is moving through you. He placed you there. But the brother didn't understand that. He said, I know about your pride and your deceit, David. You just want to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? And the way he says it, it shows you that they've had many arguments before. You know what I mean? What have I done now? I was only asking a question. Now, this is funny to me. He walks over to other people and goes, hey, hey, what's going to happen to the person that takes down Goliath? He's still asking the question. He never stops, which gives us a powerful revelation. Do not allow the jealousy of other people stop you from asking the right questions and pursuing the presence of God because there's a lot of people based on their own insecurities that want to stop you from the blessings. 
See, again, the brother had some insecurities in his life. I'm going to show you in a second. Um, but he had some things that made him jealous over David. And so he was trying to stop David because he knew, he knew the Lord was going to do something. And there's people that want to stop you because they just know the Lord is about to do something. And he, they don't want God to use you. But God, again, has chosen you. Okay, so David's asking the right question questions. He keeps pursuing the Lord. And now the questions get Saul's attention. First Samuel chapter 17, verses 31 through 35. Then David's questions was reported to King Saul. And I like what David said here. He said, don't worry about this Philistine. Now imagine like young David showing up to very big Saul. He said, don't worry about this Philistine. I will go and fight him. You ever spoken a word from the Lord and somebody laughs at you? You're going to do what? You're going to play in a church. Like you. You're going to speak in front of people. You're the one that's going to write a book to help people and impact people's lives. I'm telling you, who I used to be is not who I am today. It's funny, me and my wife were having this conversation of the way that I used to live in the past, and it's very true what Jesus said, uh, a prophet has no honor in his hometown. Because if I were to go back to my hometown, a lot of people there don't see me as a pastor. They see the old me, but I don't even know that person anymore. Because Jesus has changed me, and he's changing you today. And it's cool that some of the failures in your life, he can reuse you to see victory in that same area of your life. Am I preaching today? Is this okay? So, so the Lord is moving. He said, don't be ridiculous, Saul replied, for there's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You are only a boy. And it's not that David was small. He was just young. He came to this battle as a young boy. And, and then Saul says, see, he's been a man of war since his youth, but David persisted. But listen, Saul, you don't know what I've done in my private life. You don't know how I've been battling demons in the private areas of my life. When the times when nobody's looking, I'm spending time in the presence of God and the things that the Lord has placed in my hands, I'm being a good steward over. And so I'm not afraid of this moment because God has trained me in the privacy. Look at this. David persisted. He said, I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb, and he's not even saying a wolf or something small. He's saying a lion or a bear. Oh, my. Okay. I had to do that. Sorry. (laughs) Comes to steal the lamb from the flock. He said, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. Now, listen to this. I love this. And then he said, if the lion or this bear turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. David was a savage. (laughs) This man was a savage. These big beasts have come after me. I didn't run away. That's confidence in the Lord. Big beasts coming after you. Somebody you used to be terrified in the past. Somebody that used to bully you and mock you. Somebody that used to put you down, now they come back in your life, and there's an overwhelming confidence there because you know that the Lord is fighting your battles. It's no longer you anymore. And so you're able to stand there sometimes and take the spiritual enemy by the jaw and say, stop talking. Stop talking doubt over my life. Stop condemning me right now, for I know the truth of God's word over my life. It's okay. I'm going to club this demon to death and get it out of my life. And so we see that David was a savage, but at the same time, Don't forget this in the story, okay? He's already anointed. And so if you go to the previous chapters, you see that David was anointed already when he's in the presence of King Saul, ready to fight this battle. And he was anointed by the prophet Samuel. Something really interesting happened, though, in the story when he was anointed. As soon as David was anointed, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit came upon David's life for the rest of his life, but that the Holy Spirit also left King Saul. And so we're going to dive into that as well. But 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. And this is the message translation because I like how it's worded. It states that Samuel took his flask of oil and anointed him with his brothers standing around watching. Okay, there it is. That's why his brother had some insecurities. That's why his brother was like, oh, you showed up again? You're always the hero. I'm telling you, some people don't understand why God has chosen you because they don't see yet. God has chosen you to save them. 
And God is going to use you to do great things in their life. David is going to save the army of Israel. He's going to save his own brother's lives who were jealous over him, just like Joseph. And we see this theme over and over again. But the difference between David and Joseph is Joseph had a dream and he had to tell everybody. David's brothers, they were there. They witnessed it and they heard it from the Lord, from the prophet Samuel. And so he took this flask of oil, he anointed him, his brothers were standing there watching. And then it states, I love this, the spirit of God entered David like a rush of wind, God vitally empowering him for the rest of his life. The moment you came to Jesus, the Holy Spirit came into your body. The presence of God lives with you and he will empower you for the rest of your life. Why do you feel so defeated? Why do you feel lost in the situations and the battles that you're going through today when the Spirit of God is with you? Could it be you're not listening to his voice? Could it be you're not sitting in his holy presence? Could it be that you were distracted by everything else in your life and you're seeing the conflict, but you're not seeing that God himself is with you to see victory? Now, this is crazy because David was anointed. God vitally empowering him for the rest of his life. David was anointed to be what? He was anointed to be the king of Israel. And then it says, Samuel left and went home. This speaks to us about anointings. Because in my mind, I would have been like, but I'm king now. You anointed me. You just spoke this word over my life. I want to go home with you, Samuel. I want to go back to the palace. I'm going to go ahead and take my position. Let everybody know, hey, the Lord has chosen me. Get rid of that song, guy. It's me. But the thing about David, he was anointed by the Lord. And listen, he kept serving. And that's hard. That's hard to do. He kept serving, which means he went back to his father. He went back to watching the sheep. He went back to taking care of these small things. And then he even helped serve King Saul because he knew in the serving, there was also training for kingship. And some of the things that the Lord has placed in your hands today is actually training for the future, that future position that is to come. But like many of us today, we would have said, but I'm king now. I'm anointed. And so many times we complain to God, but God would speak to us and say, but you're not ready. You're not ready for the position. And listen, here's, we mess this up a lot because we're trying to rush the process. I want it now. I want to be there now. I want the promotion now. God is saying, the way you take care of the sheep will reveal how you take care of people. The way you hold responsibility over the things that I place in your hand will show me how you will be responsible over the big things that are coming later. The way you handle money in this situation, then it allows me to know how you're going to handle money when all of a sudden you have a lot of it. The things that you have in the little spots of your life, the way you treat a relationship, you're pursuing love. You don't even know how to love because you don't even know how to love me, Jesus is saying. You're not pursuing a relationship with Jesus. That God is love. And without God, you do not have love because his love is different from the world's love. The world's love is all about what feels good in the moment. But God's love says, I will never abandon you and I will never leave you. And even when you mess up, I will pull you up because I am here for the long run. I am empowering you for the rest of your life. Thank you, God. He was training for kingship. And I've experienced this so many, so many times, and it, it can be tempting, but I've seen people that come to me and say, Pastor, I've been anointed, and the Lord has spoken over my life, and I'm no longer going to serve like that. I'm no longer going to help these little peasants. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, well, take your anointed butt outside and go get the trash, okay? Like, it's okay. It doesn't matter how anointed you are. You are still called to serve. Yeah. Let me ask you like this. Are you more anointed than the Son of God? And Jesus Christ, because Jesus said it like this in Matthew 20, verse 28, do as I do. The Son of Man did not come for people to serve him. He came to serve others and give his life to save many people. The anointing in your life is not to be better than people. It's to save people. And you're using it only for selfish purposes to make yourself put on a pedestal looking better than other people. That's not what the anointing is for. The anointing is to save people. Um, this principle, David understood. Saul didn't. 1 Samuel 16, verse 14 continues. So after the Holy Spirit, the anointing came upon David, then this happened. Now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit, 
Notice what the Spirit does. Filled him with depression and fear. This is what it's like to live in the absence of God's presence. There is depression and there is fear in your life. All of a sudden, Saul had victory before, but now he doesn't understand victory. He's afraid of everything, which tells us why he is sitting down instead of fighting Goliath. He has been anointed king over Israel, but he's not willing to fight anymore because he lost the presence of God. That's what happens in our life too. A lot of times we walk away from the presence of God. We no longer fight. We just give up because we no longer have strength. And then we're wondering why we're so depressed by all these other things that we're allowing into our life. I need this right now just to make me feel a little bit better. I need this drink in my life just so I can kind of numb the pain right now. I need this relationship just so I can feel better about myself. But you're just opening up a lot of doors for the demons of torment to come into your life that bring more depression and more fear, now anxiety and stress and mental breakdowns. So the question is, why did this happen to Saul? Saul was chosen as a king to lead. And if you were to dive into Saul's story, guess what? He thought he was so anointed, he no longer had to listen to the Lord. God had already placed him in the position, and then he lived his life to please people instead of God. And he even admitted that to the prophet Samuel. He said, I'm sorry because I'm afraid of people instead of the Lord, and that's why I rebelled against God and did it my way. How many times have you rebelled against the Lord? How many times have you said, God, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it my way. I don't want to forgive right now. I want to hold on to this grudge so I can really put them down the way they put me down. I want to get back at them. I want to hold on to these things in my life. And you hold on to the damage and you let go of the blessings. Here's a powerful revelation. Samuel then said to Saul when he rebelled against the Lord. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 and 23. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen. He said, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than the offering of the fat of rams. What does this mean? Some of us show up to church and we serve and we do the right things on the outside, yet we go home and we don't listen to the voice of God. And God knows our hearts. See, we can come here, we can offer things and we can even come down to the altar, but sometimes it's just for ourselves, and we're still not listening to the voice of God. God wants obedience in your life because it's his obedience is what leads you into your calling, into your destiny, and how he protects you. You're his child. I want you to think of God as a worried parent speaking to their children saying, please don't do this. I'm going to give you the choice. It's up to you. You have the free will to make the wrong decisions, but I love you and I don't want you to be hurt in that way. That's how God speaks to us. We have to listen to him. Now listen to this. This is where it gets heavier. Then Samuel says to Saul, rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. When you rebel against the Lord, when you don't listen to his word over your life, it is as sinful as witchcraft. Stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols because you're already worshiping the world and the idols of the world anyway. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king, meaning when you reject God's word over your life, the blessings of God reject you. And he doesn't want that for your life. But that's what happens when we walk away from the Lord and we do it our way because we're trying to please people instead of God. It is always a damaged road that will damage your soul over time. And some of us have walked away from the blessings because we have rejected the word of the Lord. We've rejected freedom. We've rejected forgiveness. We've rejected spiritual joy. David, okay, David was so obedient to the Lord that he decided, and he made this choice, he decided to still serve the king that he knew he was chosen to replace. What if God said, you're going to be the new boss, and you don't like the boss right now? How would you show up to work? A lot of us would be like, I can't wait for you to get out of the way. I'm going to run this place so much better than you. I got better ideas than you. No, that's not David's attitude, which is why the Lord chose him. 
This is why the Lord anointed him, because he was still serving his father. He was still serving his brothers. He was still serving King Saul. He was doing all the right things because he knew that his anointing meant that he would save people. So let's get back to Goliath. After King Saul spoke a lot of doubt over David because of his own insecurities, David spoke that faith language. You want to overcome doubt? Speak faith loudly. Speak faith very loudly of what the Lord has spoken in your life. 1 Samuel 17, 36 and 37. David said, I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear. See, he knew why he had victory. He didn't brag about his own strength. He bragged about the presence of the Lord. The Lord will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented and said, all right, go ahead. He said, may the Lord be with you. Again, David's anointing was not to be better than other people, but instead to have strength to save other people. Your anointing and the word of God spoken over your life is the same way. That's why you have been called by God to be a warrior, to save people. This leads to my point number two, which is this. We need to learn how to fight with the right armor because we get confused. Okay, what's funny about this story is, yes, Goliath is a big man. Did you know that Saul's a big man too? Saul was a very big man. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2, it says his son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, and he was a head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. So it's funny to me that big bad King Saul was afraid of Goliath and young David was not. Meaning this reveals that you could be physically strong and still spiritually weak. If you want to flex on people, stop talking about your bench press and start talking about your faith press. How much weight can your faith move out of the way? I believe that my God can move the mountains out of the way. That's how much faith I have. My faith is pressing the obstacles out of my way. It's time to move into the promise. That's a flex. It's a flex on the Lord and what he can do in your life. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, the Lord doesn't see things the way people see them. Thank you, Jesus, for people will judge you by the way you look. People will judge you by what you have. People will judge you by your status, by your position, by the money you have in your life. But the Lord looks at your heart. The faith on the inside. But this is crazy. Then Saul tries to prepare David to fight the way he would fight. The man who was scared to fight this battle is trying to instruct him on how to fight. Do not take advice from people who never move by faith. Do not take, there's a lot of people that would come into your life and, well, I would have done it like this. Yeah, when did you do that? You never did because you never moved by faith. And so you need to hear clearly from the Lord. So Saul is trying to prepare David to fight in his own armor. 1 Samuel 17, 38 through 40, then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on. He strapped the sword over it. And took a step or two to see what it was like, and he looked ridiculous. He put on the wrong armor, for he had never worn such things before. And he said, I can't go in these. He protested his salt. I'm not used to them. So then David made another decision. He took off the armor of Saul, the armor of man, and he picked up five smooth stones from a stream. He put them in the shepherd's bag, then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. He was ready to go. He said, I don't need any of this. Let's put this on the floor. I'm ready to go. I wonder if Saul was like, wait, 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 wait. David, David, come back. But he just, he's ready for the fight. He has everything that he needs because it's everything the Lord trained him in in the private. And so he's confident in this this battle. But here's another warning. Do not let others force you to become who God did not call you to be. Because Saul was being tormented by a demon. He had depression and fear in his life. And he's the one instructing and guiding David how to take down Goliath. He didn't know how to take down Goliath. And so there's people in your life who are not seeing with spiritual eyes. Who do not recognize Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 that we fight a spiritual fight. And because of that, they want to uh, instruct you to put on the armor of man, the things that they would do, instead of the armor of God. You're not going to be able to win a spiritual fight in a physical way. 
It doesn't matter how many things that you, you think of and the concepts that you have and how good it sounds on the outside. So my question for you today is, are you putting on the wrong armor? Because you were instructed by somebody else who didn't really know. Maybe somebody told you in your life, you got to put on that armor of religion. That armor of religion, you got to pray five times a day, right? You got to memorize 10 scriptures every single week. You got to do this and that. And you got this checklist of things. If I just check, 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 okay, then I feel like maybe I'm qualified to be good enough to be used by God. But that's not how it works. The only qualification that you need is a relationship with Jesus Christ to follow him. Because the Pharisees were good at looking religious on the outside, but yet they denied Jesus. And so many of us are doing the same thing. We're wearing the wrong armor. Some of us are putting on that armor of success. I'm going to earn their respect. You ever said that? You ever been so hurt? You're like, I'm going to earn the respect. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show them I'm going to buy the house. I'm going to buy the car. They didn't believe in me. And then everybody's going to respect me. And they're going to ask me for advice. And then they're going to be my friends. But the people only want what you have in your life. And so the moment that runs dry, so do the people. And very quickly, your identity can be broken down when it's in your possessions that can quickly fade away. And they change on a daily basis. Yet it's funny that that's what we're pursuing every day, more than God. The things of fate. Here's a hard one. Some of us have put on the armor of looking perfect, but it doesn't fit. And it doesn't fit for a reason. But yet you don't want people to know that. And so you pretend that you have it all together when the reality is on the inside, you're really struggling with some things. And there's a deep depression in your life, but you don't want to tell anybody because you don't want to let them down. And so we're putting on the wrong armor. And I'm telling you today, you're looking at all these other things. God has already placed in your life exactly what you need to win this victory and to win this battle. Listen to this, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. You must wear all the armor that God provides. Not the armor of man, but the armor that God has provided so that you're protected as you confront the slanderer. For you are destined for all things. You will rise victorious. You will put on the truth as a belt to strengthen you to stand in triumph. Put on holiness as a protective armor that covers your heart. Guard your heart from allowing other things in it. Stand your feet alert. Then you'll be ready to share the blessing of peace in every battle. There will be peace from God in every battle you face. Take faith as your wraparound shield, for it's able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one. Embrace the power of salvation's full deliverance like a helmet to protect your thoughts from the lies. Because you know the truth. You no longer believe the demonic giants and what they're saying. And take the mighty razor sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God and pray passionately in the spirit. Call upon God's name as you consistently intercede with every form of prayer at all times. Never get up. The devil will be persistent. So be persistent in your prayer life. Every day I wake up, pray to the Lord. First thing while you're driving, pray to the Lord every single day, every day. David had the right armor. He went to go fight Goliath. And then I love David because he drops one of the grittiest lines in the whole Bible. 1 Samuel 17, 43 through 47. Goliath cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you. And I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I'll give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know. But the Lord rescues his people. They will know that the Lord rescues his people. Listen, here it is. But not with a sword and spear. Not with man's ways or the armor of man, but with the armor of God, the presence of God. Because this is the Lord's battle and he will give us victory. He will give you to us. Your marriage is the Lord's battle. The battle over your children right now, that's the Lord's battle. Your identity right now, that's the Lord's battle. Give it over to him and already see the victory that he has in your life. And every time the enemy comes at you, God will use the enemy's weapons against him. Growing as a warrior, listen, this, this is hard. 
Stop running away from the battles calling your name. But be brave enough to take them on. Verse 48, as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran to meet him. He didn't run away. And so this brings me to my last point of the message today. Point number three, you need to learn how to cut out the giant distractions. You need to learn how to cut out the giant distractions. Others said, Goliath is so big, we'll never win this fight. David said, Goliath is so big, I can't miss. I'm going to take him down. See, David knew, and here's a revelation for you. David knew that the giant would keep getting back up unless he cut off his head. And I know that sounds gruesome, but there's a powerful point to this. You must cut out the giant distractions. You have to cut out the giant distractions in your life that keep bringing you down away from the presence of the Lord. Listen to this, 1 Samuel 17, 49 and 50. Reaching into this shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone. Everything that he needed, God already placed in his hand for he had no sword. Now, then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath. And David used it to kill him and cut off his head. See, God set this up in front of everyone. The weapon that the enemy was going to use to kill David, instead, David used that weapon to kill the enemy. Meaning, sometimes the enemy is going to come at you, and, and today's culture, maybe it's social media. Don't worry, give it over to the Lord. God will use that social media to get back at them. Some people have bitterness toward you, and so maybe they're gossiping about you. Don't worry, you don't have to act like them. You do not need to become them. That's what God's trying to protect you from. Allow it to be in the Lord's hands, and he's going to use that gossip, the weapon that they had against you, and it's going to come back on them because now everybody's going to know their character, and they're going to know, I can't trust these people because they're going to talk, 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 talk. So God is going to use their weapons against them and free you, and then you're able to take down the demonic giants that want to bring you down in your life. Isaiah 54 verse 17, people will make weapons to fight against you, but their weapons will not defeat you. Some people will say things against you, but anyone who speaks against you will be proved wrong. The Lord says, that is what my servants get. They get the good things that come from me, their Lord. The good blessings that he has for you. The weapons the enemy comes against you shall not prosper. Will not attack you, will not hurt you, will not condemn you. There's a hedge protection over you and your family when you're in the presence of God. And God will use the enemy's weapons against himself, against the enemy. Now listen to what David did. So this gets interesting. First Samuel 17, 52 through 54. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. What I love about this is that the moment David moved by faith and took down the giant, it gave everybody else the faith and the courage to step up to. And maybe that's gonna happen in your family or your workplace. And God is saying, I know people are gonna mock you at first, but when the giant falls, they're gonna follow. Now it gets crazy cool. Verse 53, then the Israelite army returned and plundered the deserted Philistine camp. David took the Philistine's head to Jerusalem. I don't know if you've ever heard of this before, but when David went to Jerusalem, he had not yet conquered Jerusalem. So he couldn't take it into the city. So he did one of two things on the outside of Jerusalem. He either put Goliath's head on a stick or he buried Goliath's head in the ground. Now, what's fascinating to me, if you go to the New Testament, when Jesus is being crucified and taken to the cross, he is taken outside of Jerusalem, outside of the city walls into a place called Golgotha. And the translation of that means the place of the skull. And if you listen closely, it sounds a lot like Goliath of Gath. And so I'm telling you today that most likely the same place where David placed the giant's head is the same place that Jesus was crucified for our sins. 
that Jesus took the penalty of our sins, that he is the one taking down the giants that want to condemn you and keep you in bondage. And what this means for us is this, giant sins become giant distractions until you slay them at the cross. Giant sins become giant distractions into your life until you slay them at the cross, until you bring them at the feet of Jesus and what he's done for you. And so my question for you today at the end of this message is how much longer will you keep running away from the giants that torment you? Because here's what I've noticed. A lot of us are like, Pastor, well, I've knocked down the giant of lust, but it keeps getting back up. Cut the head off. Cut the head off. You knocked it down, but you didn't kill it. You're still allowing it into your life. There's still some open doors. You knocked it down, but you need to cut the head off. Some of us are struggling with anger and pride. And you knocked it out of your life for a little bit, but it keeps coming back because you need to cut the head off. Some of us, it's depression and fear. This giant that keeps coming back in our life saying, you're never going to be worthy, but you need to take that giant and slay it at the cross. This cross proves that God sees me as worthy because he paid for my sins and he set me free. That's how much he loves you. And here's another crazy revelation about David and Goliath. God was still training David because this was not the only giant he would face. Goliath had brothers. And David would be called to take down many other giants in the future, which means if you do not learn how to grow today and mature as a godly warrior and take down the giant distraction in your life, guess what? More distractions are going to come and you're not going to be ready. And so you have to learn today to slay it at the cross. And God's going to hold your hand. Can I have you stand right here? Let me say it like this, Jesus died on the cross to prove that every giant you face will be slain by him. This victory by him because he loves you and you don't have to do it alone and you're not alone. But how do we grow as a warrior? A quick review. You don't fight for victory. You fight from victory. You already have victory because of Jesus. Stop seeing yourself as a victim and start seeing yourself as victorious because of him. Because the way you think is how you live. The next thing is that you need to know that when God speaks a word over your life and anointing over you, it's not that you're better than other people. It's meant to save people, to help people, to serve him and to do things for his glory. And that may mean that right now you're still serving someone you don't want to serve but keep serving them, honor the Lord, and in the right time, he will lead you in the right position. It also means you need to put on the armor of God and stop putting on the armor of man. Stop allowing other people to tell you how to fight the battles that only God can win. You need to listen to his voice. And the last thing, giants become giant distractions until you slay them at the cross. The cross is available today. Jesus has risen to show us that he is victorious over anything that comes our way. He loves you so much. It's time to see yourself as a godly warrior. And so right now, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I want you to be honest. Pastor, I'm I'm struggling with fighting the battles that are in my life. I gotta be honest with you, I am on the verge of giving up. I have felt defeated. The giant enemy has been condemning me and I have been leaving, have been believing the lies and I've been hiding. And I just need strength today to stop hiding. Will you raise your hand? Will you raise your hand? Even online right now, if that's you today, go ahead and put a comment or a hand emoji, whatever you wanna do so that we can pray for you. And I'm gonna pray for everybody that's watching online and everybody in this house right now. In Jesus' name, I pray, God, for the strength and understanding that in your presence there is victory. There's victory to overcome the things that used to control us. There's victory over the bondage that used to hold us down. There's victory over the old identities that we no longer have because our identity is in you, Jesus. There's victory because you have called us, you have marked us, and you have taken down the giants. And so I pray, God, over the battles that they're facing right now, you know their battles. God, you know their battles and you know the battles that they're facing within their family life and their marriages 
and their jobs or their identity over their future, over depression, over all these things, these worries, the anxiety in their life. And right now I pray, God, that they bring it to the cross. God, I pray right now, Father, that they just say, I give it to you. Will you just repeat this after me? Lord, Lord, I give it to you. I give you my battles because I know there is victory in you. There is victory in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray, Father, for that freedom today. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, can everybody just give a shout of praise to the Lord today? Hallelujah, this victory today. Hey guys, this is Pastor Bobby Chandler, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor, before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel, and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. I also want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church, because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So, we love our Authentic family. Family, and thank you today for joining us.